So sedimentology and stratigraphy are about as old as mineralogy as a field of study. Leonardo da Vinci uh, provided one of the first environmental interpretations from sedimentary rocks. He interpreted fossils at the top of the Italian Apennines as evidence for an ancient ocean. The logic he used behind this is now called the principle of uniformitarianism. The idea is similar organisms produce similar shells now and in the past. The logic is if you see shells on the tops of mountains that look like those from organisms in the oceans today, the shells on the mountaintops were probably once in the oceans too. He didn't know at the time whether the mountaintops went up or the oceans went down, and that's not a question that we could answer until we understood plate tectonics and understood that the Italian Apennines were faulted um, up uh, during a collision between Europe and Africa. But the idea is still the same. We can look at ancient rocks and we can use our understanding of modern processes to interpret how those form. And that's the, the key, one of the key concepts um, uh, we're going to be using for going from the modern processes to the ancient rocks. So if we state it as a key concept, uh, we can say the characteristics of sedimentary rocks can be used to determine the environmental conditions under which they were deposited and the environmental conditions allow you to predict the characteristic of sediments that are likely to be deposited in that environment. This is the principle of uniformitarianism, and it was formulated officially for, um, by James Hutton in the mid-1700s. And we are going to use that throughout the class. We can use the principle of uniformitarianism to interpret things like the sand that we see on the beach. Here you can see there's an interesting topography on that sand, um, and we have some footprints here for scale. So we can watch in a natural environment to see when this various topography forms, um, or we can actually do experiments. And so these particular ripples are, these particular structures are ripples due to currents, and we and there's this nice example from YouTube uh, with ripples forming in a flume. So in this case, the flow is going from left to right, and you can watch the sand move in a cross-sectional view. So we're looking at it sideways. And what you see is that the back of the ripple has a, a fairly narrow slope, somewhat like you see in this upper part here. And then the crest of the ripple is much steeper, like you can see on the upper part. And the in general, those ripples are migrating downstream. Okay, so we can actually link what we see in terms of the experiment with what we see in the modern environment. We can also link that to the ancient environment. So here's a photograph uh, from some Neoproterozoic sandstones uh, from Namibia. And uh, they uh, show the characteristics of what the ripples look like in cross section. So if I trace a line, and I'm going to make my, my line a little smaller here. So we have a, a hand lens for say, scale up here. It's a little over a centimeter. Uh, cross. So what we actually see here are these lines, if I can draw them well, that show a more gentle slope on one side and a steeper slope on the other, a lot like we see the, in the modern ripples and a lot like we see in the experiments. So that suggests that we can interpret these ripples that are hundreds of millions of years old, these structures, as ripples from a current. If we interpret the current as going one direction, that uh, tells us something about the environment and the flow. Um, we can similarly do that um, with other structures. So there's a difference if you have a current versus a wave. And so this video shows we're looking down in a flume where the water is moving back and forth to the right, or to the left, to the right, to the left, to the right. And you can see that the sand is getting transported 
back and forth. And these ripples have a more uniform slope on the two different sides. Right. So this is a downward looking view and we can actually uh, looking, look at that in on modern beaches. So this is from uh, Broome Beach in Western Australia here. And those, it's uh, in an area where we would normally have uh, waves and we have a centimeter scales. This whole thing's about 10 centimeters long. And you have ripples that have about the same slope on either side. And again, we can compare those to ancient ripples, uh, for example, here. And these are Archean, again with a hand lens uh, for scale. And what you see in terms of the lamina is that you see the lamina dipping in both directions about evenly. Not everywhere in the bed, but really, really commonly. And so that looks fundamentally different than what we see for the current ripples where most of the lamina, you have a series of lamina that are coming down this way and surfaces going across the top like this. Right? So the principle of uniformitarianism allows us to match what we're seeing in the rocks with what we see in the sediments with what we see in experiments. And so it's that connection between the process and the result that is really what makes uniformitarianism. So the principle of uniformitarianism has been a little bit controversial. So for example, um, and sometimes it's, it's interpreted as processes having to be continuous and uniform. That's not how I view it. So in my interpretation, you can have rare events uh, it, the key is connecting the process with the deposit. For example, a meteorite impact uh, is something that happens very abruptly. It's an event. And the way I look at it is meteorite impacts, no matter when they happen, cause similar deposits. So for example, the meteorite impact, the evidence for meteorite impact at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary is the presence of a large crater, the presence of tsunami waves, and uh, impact spherules where a rock was vaporized and put up into the atmosphere where it uh, condensed into these little spherules that then fell back to earth. So the idea is that you can have uh, events and things that don't happen continuously through time and still apply the principle of uniformitarianism. Again, it's the similar processes produce similar uh, events is one of the key aspects of uniformitarianism. So I want to add that right now that I'm using the principle of uniformitarianism as a scientist working on the NASA Mars Science Laboratory uh, rover. Uh, we are looking at sedimentary rocks on Gale Crater on Mars and what we're doing is we're looking at the grains, their size, their rounding, uh, their orientation. We're looking for things like current ripples. We found some of those. We have not yet found wave ripples. But when we make those observations, we're using this concept of the principle of uniformitarianism. We are assuming that we can interpret those rocks as representing specific processes as we know them on Earth and from experiments on Earth. In some cases, because Mars is a smaller planet, there might be some de differences in the details and we can evaluate and model those. But we still think that to get current, you, if you have a flow going in one direction, you're like at the right speed, you're likely to get current ripples. Whereas if you have waves going back and forth, you're likely to get the more rounded wave ripples. Thus, uh, the principle of uniformitarianism is useful even when looking at sediments for example, on another planet. The physics is very similar no matter where you go. Thanks for watching.